All right, welcome to my presentation. Uh, this is Hybrid PhysSec Tools, Best of Both Worlds or Just Weird. Um, this is part of Tools Lockpick Village for DEF CON 28. My name is Didymus. So I always like to start out with an agenda so we kind of know where we're going with the conversation, as well as if you come back and watch this recording or view these slides, then you know um, kind of bookmark where different things were. So we're going to start out, talk about what are physics tools, what do we use them for, and then why? Why are we looking into the whole hybrid concept, and is there even a need? And then what about physics tools? What's already out there? What are some ideas that work? What don't work? Um, and then we'll go to the how. So this is something I'm interested. How do I start? Or what would I do if this is something that speaks to me that I'm kind of interested in? So with that, we'll launch right into it. A little bit about me, Didymus, I've been picking locks for about 13 years. I picked it up when I was in college. I had a locksmith uncle who taught me a lot of the things and just went from there. My favorite pick is DeForest Offset, and my least favorite pick is this thing. My day job, I'm a security engineer for a technology company on their uh, security operations and engineering team, and I'm a lockpick enthusiast. And I'm also happily married and a father of four children. All right, launching into it. So what are PhysSec tools? First of all, when I say PhysSec, I mean physical security. Um, I mostly say that because I don't want to have to say physical security tools a million times in this presentation. So if you think about it, any tools that are used to test and or compromise physical security. I made up this definition, but that's the basic gist of it. So a few examples of this that you may or may not be familiar with from if you're watching this presentation, you're most likely familiar with it. So things like lock picks, bypass tools, drivers, jigglers, shims, etc., are all examples of PhysSec tools. A couple weird examples, not so much weird, maybe just uh, a bit different or maybe things that you might not consider as physical security tools are things like multi-tools, your standard Gerber, Leatherman, SOG type things. Wedges, these could be aluminum, these could be the air compressed wedges, as well as compressed air. These are the cans that clean your keyboard and uh, computer parts. And then film reel, you can actually use reel-to-reel -reel, uh, theater film reel to compromise certain types of doors. Uh, check out Pope. Um, Steve's got a few um, videos talking about this as well. Some awesome examples. So things like the thumb latch tool. If you don't know what this is, you should definitely check it out. It's a really neat tool, extremely useful, especially with double doors and things like that. And then the under the door tool. I don't know a single physical security pen tester who does not have an under the door tool. Uh, they are a must have. They make the job very easy and very nice to have. And then there's the stuff that works in the pinch. So this is would be like your standard bobby pins, paper clips, safety pins, stuff you find around. Like you could take a pop bottle and cut it, and then you have something that you could shim with. Um, this would be, you know, kind of the MacGyver method, I guess you could say. So let's talk hybrid for a minute. Hybrid tools, the way I'm interpreting them is like when typically there's one tool um, that's used traditionally to manipulate a lock or bypass a latch or a door or something like that. But a hybrid tool is like, there's more than one use for it instead of just the very specific one. I didn't want to use the word multi-tool in this presentation because I didn't want to confuse it with actual multi-tools, your Leatherman, your Gerbers, your things like that. Also, I do want to get this disclaimer out right here at the beginning, but hybrid doesn't always mean better. And what I mean by that is, just because it can do two things, it doesn't mean it can do two things really well. Um, I remember years ago, I was thinking about getting a motorcycle, but I wanted something that I could ride and have it be street legal, but I could also go dirt biking in the mountains. And I was talking to some of my friends and they said, yeah, you could totally do that. It's gonna suck at both of them though. So it's better to get something more specific, but that's not always the case. Sometimes something that can do two things is still good at two things. It just might not be as well. So the kind of have this dichotomy of you have this super specific exact tool for this exact situation. You want that or possibly compromise to have something that is more versatile, maybe not be 
the exact perfect one you would use, but you're trained, you use it, and you can do more with less kind of philosophy. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about hybrid tools. There's a picture of a couple here where you have like a top of the keyway tensioner here, as well as a tubular tensioner, and then a comb pick. You know, there's, there's space on that. It's three tools in one. It's small, it's slim, it's compact. And then another one is a double-sided pick. And also creativity. This is kind of a way um, various people can express their creativity. You know, someone will like it. There's always trolls. Someone will hate it, but someone will always like it, is what I've discovered. So now we get to the why. So why would you want to do this? Well, it comes back to that, can I do more with less? Uh, I like to think of the example where, let's say you're doing a physical um, pen test engagement, and you're going in during business hours. Like, yeah, after hours, take your full tactical bag, you know, and everything. But if you're going in trying to masquerade as an employee or tailgate or something like that, you can't go in with your whole kit. You can't walk in like a suit and tie, and then you have a 5'11 Molly tactical backpack with all of your goodies and your go bag and everything in it. It's going to stick out. So sometimes you need like custom tools. A lot of times physical pen testers will actually have custom tools for these type of situations. Uh, again, uh, creativity, this is a great way to do it. I'm not a developer. You know, you come to DEF CON, a lot of people have these brand new zero days and Metasploit uh, modules and things like that. I'm not much of a programmer, but I like designing things. I, I'm more of a physical tool kind of person. I like the actual creating something and holding it in your hand. And another thing, like it could lead to better tools overall. And we're going to have a couple examples of that coming up. You know, your silly idea might be the tool that locksmiths and lock sport enthusiasts have been wanting, but you just didn't know. So some things that inspire me. I really like spy stuff. I like I like the James Bond films. I like the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC. I'd recommend, you know, when you can, check it out. It's well worth it. Um, also, I like the, um, the Sears stuff. So the survival, evasion, resistance, escape type stuff. So this first thing here at the top is an actual uh, titanium escape ring. It's got inside the ring, it has a saw blade, it has, it, it also functions as a handcuff shim, and it's kind of cool. I don't have one myself, but I always thought that'd be kind of cool to have. Then the top right, bottom left, these are two exhibits from the International Spy Museum. One is a jackknife from several years ago, and then in the bottom left, we have one of the first lockpick pens, where the picks were actually concealed inside the pen body. And then on the bottom right, we have an example of a Gerber multi-tool that someone took and actually added lockpicks to it. So in this person's everyday carry, he had a tensioner, he had a couple, you know, your go-to lockpicks. And there's Instructables on that. Um, you can go to Instructables and find this. And the link is in the notes as well. So let's talk about an improvement example. I really like Sparrow stuff. They're not sponsoring this or anything like this. I have a lot of their tools, but I do like Sparrow stuff. Some of the things they have over, kind of looking over here on the left, we've got their wafer jigglers, their wafer picks. You know, the four of them, they come on a keychain. They're really nice. They're good at getting in cabinet locks and some simpler locks and things like that. And then on the bottom left, you have your mini gym. Uh, this is something that I have a couple of. I really like it. And then there in the middle, you have the sparrow shank, which is used for decoding as well as bypassing unshielded padlocks, different things like that. So you take these three different tools, three, you know, however many different tools, and they actually have a set called Sparrow's Dark Shift. So they created an expansion set for this. And here on the right, you have, you know, you have your standard Slim Jim, but they actually narrowed the handle down, kind of cut a few holes in it to give it a little bit lighter weight. And then you look at the next two tools, those are double-sided wafer picks that are, they have the exact same profile as the Sparrow's wafers over on the left, but they're double-sided and take up less space. They're very skinny. In fact, I carry these in my wallet. Next, you have a Sparrow Shank, which is shorter, and it has a bit wider handle, so maybe you can palm it better. And then this thing on the end is a hook rake pick that you can use both for single pin picking as well as for raking. It's called the Quick Strike. And from what I can tell, you can only get it in the Dark Shift expansion set. I really like it. It's fun. It's definitely worth looking into if you haven't played around with them before. And then a couple things, you know, first, it's a, it can, you can use it as a hook or as a rake. 
And then they add these serrations. So starting with that left one, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but they're actually very fine serrations. Part of the dark shift set that they made was so you could use it with or without gloves on. So having those serrations, especially in the dark, would be extremely valuable. Now, looking at the serrations on the two double-sided wafer picks, as well as the mini gem, you can see those look a lot more pronounced, and they actually look a little painful. They're really not that bad because they're flat on top. I'll be talking about serrations here in a little bit. But that's something where they took a couple existing tools. How can we combine them, make them more useful, more versatile, smaller form factor, that kind of stuff. Another example. So this is the Tag 5 Industries Scorpion lockpick set. This is something that I acquired a few years, you, yeah, a couple of years ago. And you'll notice that it's your standard tumbler, uh, sorry, your standard tension tools, as well as your standard picks. However, the handles are very different. Um, definitely check them out. The reason why is because these were designed by a government covert entry specialist. Um, he, he worked, from what I understand, exclusively for the government agencies designing covert entry tools. Now, whereas with a standard lockpick, you hold it more like you would hold a pencil, these you actually hold kind of like you're holding a handle of some sort. Um, typically, when you're doing covert entry, you don't want to like go up to a door, get down on your knees, and start working on the doorknob. This is something where you could actually stand up, hold it a different way, and look way less conspicuous. And this is something that um, he designed for government agencies and the like before coming and making them available to the public. They're really neat. They, they are different to get used to, but they are really, really nice. I'm a fan of them. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm a fan of International Spy Museum. They're actually featured in some of the exhibits. So let's talk about some hybrid tool examples. Uh, this is Locknoob. If you don't follow Locknoob, um, on Twitter and on YouTube. I highly recommend it. He puts out great content. He's done a few collaborations. These are just three of the collaborations that he's done and then an interesting hybrid uh, multi-tool that he designed. Um, I could go and explain it, but he does a much better job. Definitely check out his stuff. But starting at the top left, we have the gut wrench. Um, this is a locksmithing tool where when you would take apart cylinders and you know change out the pins and stuff, at times you would need like four or five different tools. And he thought, you know, why don't I just design one that has all of them in one? And I know locksmiths that actually use this because like I have one tool instead of having to rummage all over my workbench and find the right tool to fit the right cylinder and the right diameter and stuff. Moving over to the top right, this is a lock. I, I kind of think of it like a locksmith kit in a multi-tool. Like he, he designed it in such a way that it had various picks, a knife, a uh, screwdriver so you could take out Phillips head screws and things like that and like your standard American padlocks, place to put tensioners, tweezers, as well as plug followers. Again, these are YouTube videos. Check them out. He breaks it down way better than I could. Moving to the bottom right, you have the goat wrench. So this is where he took, um, where he took that tensioner that I showed earlier. And there's some tubular locks that it fits in. There's some that it doesn't. So he actually did a few prototypes, took some stock steel and designed his own. And then once he got the prototypes where he wanted, did a collaboration with Sparrows. And you can actually get the goat wrench today. And then finally on the bottom left, we have the Sparrows Medusa. We'll, we'll have a bit close up here in a second. But I want you to point to uh, notice that it's a pick that you can do single pin picking as well as raking with. All right, and now we get to the, or just plain weird. So remember back in 1999, the James Bond movie, The World Is Not Enough, he had to break into some place. And so he had like this switchblade actioned like, credit card and he flipped it out. And, you know, I, I didn't pick locks at the time, but going back, looking at it, it's very interesting. I mean, it's kind of, we've got like some kind of S snake rate going on. And then on the backside, it's like a multi, multiple ridge type raking lock. I don't know. It looked cool for Hollywood. And then here on the right, more practical from uh, Johnny Depp's rendition of Sherlock Holmes, where he had various tryout um, lever lock boarded style picks, um, which is interesting. So, or just weird or practical or Hollywood. I don't know. But it is kind of interesting to see this stuff in media. So 
back to Lockman for a second. This is a YouTube video where he talks specifically about the Medusa, and he, I kind of follow the same process he does, um, at least that he laid out in this video about designing new picks. So starts with sketches, starts designing them. You know, here's what I kind of want, here's what I want it to do, and start, you know, it's a lot easier to make mistakes on pen and paper before you start making prototypes. So he started running through a couple different designs, what he was kind of thinking, where he wanted to go with it. Once you get to that point, you can take the one you like, and then you start making your own custom prototypes. You can, you know, get some kind of rotary tool, create this yourself, or you could even switch it over to computer-based modeling, like CAD design, go from that. And then you tweak and work with your uh, prototype until you have something that you really like, which eventually ended up being the Sparrows Medusa. Um, and of course, laser etch, you got this really beautiful artwork of this Medusa figure with the snakes and the hair and everything. It's a really, it's a really beautiful pick, and it's also really functional. When in doubt, laser etching is pretty cool. So where to begin? This is something that's kind of interesting, or maybe you've thought of a tool or something like that. So this is kind of the process I follow, but it's like, you know, what am I trying to solve or improve upon? Kind of start there, like start brainstorming. And I found that brainstorming always works best when I'm uh, picking. So, and then ask yourself, what's currently out there? Who's already done a lot of the work? Like think of sparrows taking their own designs and then tweaking them and making them better in the dark shift expansion. Then you get into the, to the design and drawing phase. Then you start doing prototypes and testing. And then, you know, you repeat that until you're happy with how your prototypes are. And then you move to the production phase. So this is something I did a few years ago when I, when I came up with this crazy idea, like I wanted something sort of like a lockpick wallet card that was more than a one-time use. Like there's some that are good, like Tool makes a great one. I like that once you break it out, you can actually put it on a keychain. it's useful. And there's some that, you know, they're definitely one-time use. Um, they're still good, they work in a pinch, but I wanted something that was like reusable and durable and stuff like that. And I was trying to think of, you know, the spy type stuff. So that's when I came up with like lockpick collar stays. And I did the same process. This is before I even followed lock noob, but it was like, I'm going to draw this out. You know, this is definitely a hybrid tool. It stiffens my collar and it picks locks. And then I started taking actual collar stays and cutting them up and trying to make useful picks out of them. At that point, I started, I reached out to my brother-in-law who was a machinist. And we started catting them up and drawing them and we started making them. And you can see these are like, Mark one and Mark two prototypes where I had really sharp lines and things like that. And it wasn't really smooth. And you know, that S rake looks really dorky. And I started tweaking the S rake and then the diamond pick just looks ridiculous. And so I worked on that. So still realize this is the first time I ever did something like this. It's kind of like, okay, uh, it may not be good at both things, but it's an interesting little spy gadget, what have you. So let's say you do that get your prototypes working the way you want it. Now it's time for manufacturing and production. So I usually get my car, my raw materials from McMaster Car. I like their website. You can order metal from there. It's very specific on the type, the gauge, um, the dimensions. It, you pay more for it, but it's actually been pretty good for me. Now, as far as production, you can either design these all yourself if you have that kind of time, or what I like to do, I actually pay someone I have a metal shop that does precision laser. I can give them my CAD drawings, I can give them the metal, and then they just charge me for um, thickness and laser runtime. So it's fairly affordable. And then as far as shipping, I've done it both ways. Um, you know, you could have it like a Google Forms or a Google Sites type thing, and once you fill it out, it sends you to a PayPal button. PayPal handles all the shipping and postage and stuff like that. It works pretty well. Um, so when I did my lockpick collar stays, I did do a crowdfunding through Kickstarter, and it was definitely a learning experience. There's some pros and cons, but, you know, this is all my opinion on it. You know, what's nice is it's a great platform to get your stuff out there. It handles all the campaigning, the deadlines. It reaches out to the buyers securely. They handle all the processing and stuff. It's great. There are some cons to it. Basically, you know, there, there's taxes. No matter how you do this, you should be paying taxes, right? If you make more than make, if you, um, from your backers, get up to $20,000 raised, they give you tax forms. Otherwise, they're like, 
you take care of it yourself. Also, they're completely, um, they can't be held liable in any way if you don't fulfill on payments or things like that. And then, you know, when the campaign ends and you're funded, you don't immediately get the money. It's like, it could be anywhere from one to four weeks, depending, because they're gathering money from the backers on your behalf. And then, you know, so my advice, you know, figure out your design, your manufacturing, your production first. Do not ever use funds for your own research and development and figuring out mistakes. Because I don't know how thin your margins are if you're doing a crowdfunding, but if they're thin and then you're using that money to figure out your mistakes, you're going to have a bad time. So, and then always be responsive, reach out to people, you know, have a Twitter presence, whatever, and make sure you fulfill commitments. So these are my uh, lockpick collar stays I designed. These are actually the uh, DEF CON 27 ones that I did. I uh, did some, like a limited edition, like run of them and did some laser etching. So when in doubt, you know, lasers. So current projects that I'm working on, I kind of only have one right now. I've had a bit more time because of COVID-19 and things like that. But a little bit of backstory, my wife and I moved into a new house in December and all of the internal doors had like different locks on them. Some of them were like the, the small flathead screwdrivers, some were like the push pin, and some were even like cheap quick set handles. And I was like, why are you putting this inside a house? And my kids would like lock these and close the door. So I got to the point where I was always carrying around a Sparrows mini gym with me. And then sometimes it would be that quick set. And I was like, oh, okay, I pull out my, you know, my uh, RCS jackknife or whatever, and I pick it open because I didn't have the key to it. I eventually replaced the doorknobs and we ordered you know, the little screwdriver keys for it. But I kind of got thinking like, it'd be nice to have like a bypass tool that was like, you know, I can gym, but I can also use it to like quick pick or jiggle and open things. Also, I didn't want to carry a traveler soak around in my pocket because that's really sharp and uncomfortable. So, all right, so let's take this process. This is where I'm currently at. Uh, I would definitely wanted a bypass tool, something that I could latch slip or Lloyd with. I wanted a small form factor. I wanted something that I could take on an airplane if I needed. Like there wasn't anything sharp or bladed. It was under seven inches, reusable, durable, versatile, things like that. So I started looking at what was currently available. You know, we have your mini gym. I started thinking about common keys, um, you know, your CH751s. And then auto jigglers, which you can use for more than just cars. Also the wafer picks that we showed earlier. Started thinking about the TSA 007 because that's the most common TSA key. And then like a shank or decoder type thing. And then we go to the design phase. So I'm a pen and paper kind of guy. What's nice about this is you can actually put the lockpick tools directly on the paper and trace it out. It's much easier than freehanding it. So I started sketching out the ideas, started thinking about the different kind of tools that I wanted. And then at that point, I switched over to CAD. Now I've done both LibreCAD, which is an open source. It's You can tell it's open source. And then I've also used Autodesk Fusion 360. It's great. It, seems like it's a lot more developed. It is a paid service, but you can get it through like a student one, or they do have a startup license if you make less than a hundred thousand type thing. Uh, so I started designing it and it was, it was really intuitive. I mean, I watched a couple of YouTube videos and uh, some Pluralsight courses on how to use it. It really got me going uh, pretty quick. And so I designed a, you know, I took a mini gym on the one side and then I wanted like a double-sided wafer pick. And then I built in a little finger well, because I think it's important that tools are comfortable in the hand, you know, work on ergonomics. And then at that point, you can extrude it out to the width and everything that you want, and then start working with the designs and stuff like that. So that's what I did. And then I designed three more, and these are my Mark I prototypes. And I put a hole in it because I was thinking, you know, maybe we want a lanyard hole or put this on a keychain or something like that. And so at the top, Working our way down, we have our CH751, then we have our double-sided wafer pick. Then the next two are auto jigglers that you could use as a double-sided auto jiggler or kind of like a, a dull, kind of a shallower half diamond um, pick. Um, you can't see it too well, but I did try to add serrations. My, my next one I need to, my next uh, designs, I actually need to tweak this a little bit, kind of standardize the size of the, the mini gym side and things like that. Um, I will say something about serrations. If you do put serrations in, they are nice. Make sure they're dull serrations. And the way I found that works pretty well for that is half circles with lines connecting them. They're really nice. You can fill them, but they don't cut into you. 
don't do the sawtooth serrations. So something you should think about. So at this point, I have my Mark I prototypes. I did a batch of about 100 of them. Well, no, I did a batch of like 40 sets or so. Uh, I sent them out to a couple people. I still have quite a few. Um, but you can see a few things that I want to make some changes on. There was a little, um, in the wafer pick, you can see a little half circle that was cut out there. That was just a mistake by the manufacturer. And you can see that the serrations didn't really come through. I didn't have a fine enough laser going. A couple ideas that I scrapped was like the TSA uh, 007. The reason why is this is in uh, 31 thousandths of an inch or uh, 0.787 millimeter steel. And the way the TSA 007 is set up, it's more like a Z-shaped keyway. It just wasn't feasible. However, the CH751 works great. It works perfect. I'm not going to change anything with that. I really like it. Also, I did decide to get rid of the decoder because if I want this to be TSA safe, I can't have a sp sharp spike on it. So next steps, I'm going to standardize the gym dimensions across all of them. I'm going to fix that weird circle. Uh, change the pick profile on the wafer pick. You'll notice at the point there's actually two peaks on the top and the bottom makes it just a bit too thick. So I'm going to change those dimensions a little bit and then, you know, deeper, more pronounced serrations. All right. So kind of what I just said here, keep improving prototypes because I'm not happy how they are yet. But I do recommend you send them out to trusted friends who will give candid feedback. Don't send it out to positive people who are like, like, well, don't send it out to people who are only positive, like, oh, this is so great. You're going to make a million dollars off of this. So clever. You know, send it out to people who like know what they're talking about. Also, like, I can see the value of this. Here's something I would change. Here's how it feels in my hand. This is really valuable because then you're getting the feedback you want. If you're doing a crowdfunding type thing, you're not spending money on figuring this out. You know, I'm paying this up front, whatever. Uh, raw materials manufacturing, I've already covered that, things I like to do. And then once you're happy, is this a point where you want to reach out to lockpick companies and look at some kind of a collaboration? Uh, Sparrows, I've reached out to them before. They seem pretty good to work with. Um, you know, I don't have any negative feelings against them. I decided not to go with them, um, just make it on my own. But I, I know other people have had success with it and been happy with it, and I, you know, more power to them. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I've already talked about how I hire a metal shop to laser cut them for me. I send them the CAD files, and they're really good with CAD, and they can, like, find out the most... Um, the best layout to get the most out of my sheet metal and stuff and calculate costs and things like that. And then distribution. I mean, are you going to send this uh, domestic? Are you going to send it international? One thing I discovered is I had all these international buyers in my caller state. So like, is this going to be customs friendly? And I didn't consider it and said, you know what? Yep. I could probably make a lot more money, but I'm going to cover customs because I don't want to be a jerk. But that's kind of the point you, you get to, you know, it's like, I want to make something good. I want people to be happy. Yeah, some people are going to think it's dumb. They don't have to buy it. Some people are going to think, hey, this is kind of cool. This is this is clever. I mean, it's something I might throw in my wallet or, you know, I like this kind of hybrid tool. It's really interesting. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. And that is my talk pretty much. Um, I'm on Discord. I go by Didymus. I'm also on Twitter if you want to send me a DM. I think they'll be open for a little while, but same handle. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them as best I can. But, you know, I'm curious to see what what kind of uh, hybrid phys tech tools you might have out there, what ideas you might have. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and thanks for taking the time. So with that, I will say thanks and enjoy the rest of the con.